Good evening, everyone. My name is Giovanni Escobedo. I am the uh, Regional Advocacy Director for Western Texas, um, here in South Texas. Um, I want to welcome everyone and thank everyone for coming here tonight. Uh, we are excited, Western Texas is excited to host a series of Pantheon Forums across the state. And tonight we get to be here at Carrizo Springs to talk about um, public education for hazardous treatment. The goal of the Cabinet Forums for Raising Head Texas is to bring together the community with the Cabinet to have uh, public education uh, um, discussions and conversations. Uh, we hope that uh, after the forum, people are learn more about the candidates and they become informed voters when they go to the polls. Um, the Cabinet Forum tonight is a public education candidate forums. We will not be asking questions about our way to public education. So again, I'd like to thank everyone who helped uh, organize the forum in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, everyone who came together, everyone who showed up. Uh, thank you to the candidates. Thank you for being here tonight. I know it's a busy time for the campaigns. Uh, thank you for making the time to come uh, to Carrizo Springs and to talk to the uh, people about public education. And with that, I'd like to start by introducing our uh, moderator, Lynn uh, Coy. She is the Senior Advocacy Director for Major Hand Texas. Um, Good evening, everyone. It's a real treat to be here with all of you. As Gio said, my name is Libby Cohen. I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy at Raise Your Hand Texas. Uh, and would like to reiterate our thanks to the candidates for taking the time to be here, um, as well as our thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your schedules to come join us tonight. Uh, at Raise Your Hand, we believe there is nothing you can do to better support public education than to be an informed public education voter. And you guys are taking a really, really great step towards being able to do that tonight. So, so thank you very much. All right, our goal for public education candidate forums is to create a civil environment of mutual respect in which candidates have the opportunity to communicate clearly and audience members have the opportunity to learn more about both issues and candidates. So before we begin, we are going to first silence our electronics as a matter of courtesy to our candidates and to each other, as well as review a few important forum rules. So I've got rules for our candidates, and then I have rules for you all, for the audience as well. Rules for candidates. First, please respond directly to the content matter and the question posed. We previously shared the candidate forum questions with all candidates. Second, please direct your answers only to myself and to attendees. Do not engage your fellow candidates. You will have two minutes for an opening statement, two minutes to answer each question, and two minutes for a closing statement. If I feel that you have not clearly responded to the question, I may ask clarifying follow-up questions and offer 30 seconds for your response. Please refrain from referencing other candidates' past statements or voting records. We want you to use your time to allow those present to learn more about you, not to pick on your opponents, Please do not interrupt your fellow candidates when they are responding to a question. Keep to stated time limits for responses and respect the timekeeper's request. Timekeeper, would you please raise your hand? Here is our timekeeper. And if I feel at any time that a candidate is not respecting these rules, I will interrupt them and redirect the conversation to the subject matter at the end. All right, rules for audience members. Please maintain an atmosphere of respect. Audience group members are asked to refrain from applause, outbursts, or other signs of approval or disapproval during the entirety of the forum. We will have the opportunity to show our appreciation to the candidates at the conclusion of the forum. Audience outbursts will not be tolerated, and audience members who engage in outbursts during the forum will be asked to leave. Please do not attempt to distribute campaign materials anywhere other than at the designated candidate tables. Campaign materials can only be distributed at those tables, and no materials may be handed out to attendees as they are entering or exiting this space. We ask that our audience members help to maintain the neutrality of the space by refraining from wearing campaign t-shirts while the forum is going on. Uh, if you're wearing a campaign t-shirt, we ask that you cover it or turn it inside out. We welcome your tweets and social media posts from the event, and we would appreciate your tagging us using the tag 
at RYHT or at RYHT underscore S Texas. We also welcome the use of the hashtags TexEd and TexPledge. Okay, now for a few logistics. This event is being filmed and will be available on the Raise Your Hand Texas website within the next few days. Un unauthorized videos are not allowed and candidates may not use our video content for campaign purposes. Photos may be taken if the camera is silent, does not use a flash, and does not block anyone's view. Questions this evening focus on the issue of public education, have been previously prepared by Raise Your Hand Texas, and have been provided to all candidates in advance. The candidates who are present with us tonight have been seated alphabetically. The speaking order for candidate statements and answers to moderated questions will vary, and each candidate will have the opportunity to go first. Our timekeeper will raise signs to let us know how much time is left. The yellow sign indicates that 30 seconds remain, and the red sign indicates that time is up. Candidates are asked to please stop promptly when your time is up. And again, if I feel that a candidate is not respecting these rules, I will kindly interrupt the candidates and redirect the conversation. All right, with that, let's move on to our candidate introductions. All candidates for the Office of State Representative for District 80 were invited here tonight. The candidates that we have present are Cecilia Castellano, Rosie Cuellar, Carlos Lopez, and Clint Powell. We'll move on to opening remarks. Each candidate, you have two minutes to introduce yourself and tell us about you and your family's experience with Texas public schools. Ms. Castellano, if you'll begin. Good evening, everybody. I'm Cecilia Castellano. I'm from Atascosa County. I'm a third generation Texan. I'm also a daughter of a veteran and a daughter. My mother was a, a teacher as well in the education of community. As a mother um, of two boys, my experience with public education has not been so good. I was one of the mothers that often fought the public education regarding special education. And this is my why, this is why I'm here, is to be the voice for the voiceless, is to be the voice for the children with disabilities, and to ensure that there's adequate money being brought back to our public schools and truly fund our teachers, as well as the special education departments, 504 departments as well. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you all for having us. My name is Rosie Cuella. I'm from Laredo, Texas. I was born there, but I grew up for 10 years in a little town called Campbell, Texas. Uh, we were there for nine years, returned back to Laredo. I am a product of public schools. I went to elementary, high school, and college. I went to, I'm an attorney. I went to law school in Houston. I had my two children in law school. I was six months pregnant when I took the bar and I passed it on the first try. Uh, again, I'm an attorney. I ran for municipal court judge. I was a judge for Laredo and Rio Bravo. And after that, I was uh, the tax assessor collector for Webb County. So I have uh, the varied experience, the personal life experience. I come from humble beginnings. Uh, my parents were migrant workers. They did not speak English. Uh, they had a third and sixth grade education. They taught us to get that education, which we did. We were afforded all the opportunities, which I took advantage of. And uh, also, they taught us to give back. I have over 40 years of community commitment, which involves especially children. So this is very important to me. Education is certainly the equalizer for, for our children. That's why I will fight for our families and our children to make sure that they are fully funded, that our teachers get the pay raise they deserve, and that we have more student success through programs that will help our children 
and, and also we need to focus on school safety. So I come from a family of humble beginnings. I come from a family of public service where my brother is a sheriff of Webb County and my brother is a congressman of District 28, Henry Cuella, who's certainly a champion of education. Thank you. Buenas tardes. I'm Carlos Lopez from Uvalde. Born and raised there, small town Uvalde. Um, I'm an educator. I'm a small business owner. I was former Democratic chair there in Uvalde. So what that means is I've always been a community, community advocate. I do the slow burning work every single time, whether it's election season or not, in trying to uplift our communities. Those are the things that I stand for. Those are the issues that I fight for. You know, the Evaldi tragedy, obviously with school safety, is near and dear to my heart. Um, it's one of the reasons, if not the main reason, why I chose to run for this position, because I think our children, our school system, you know, we, we entrust our most tre precious treasures to the school system, and they deserve the absolute best in regards to safety, teachers, support staff. Those are the things that I fight for. So if you're looking for a candidate that's going to put these issues first, I'm the person that you're going to want to need in that position because to me, those are, that's the number one priority. So I look forward to, to this evening. Thank you, Ray, for having, giving us the opportunity to do this. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Clint Powell, uh, also a candidate for state rep for District 80. And education, you know, we all know how important that is for our communities and getting teachers into those communities with good pay and housing is very important. And as a mayor of Pleasanton, I've been on the city council for I'm in my 13th year, 10th uh, as the mayor. And I luckily got to be there when the ISD and the city mended the relationship because the relationship between the city and the ISD was really poor. I mean, uh, we were just kind of tearing at each other to get things done. And we had a new city manager coming on and a new uh, superintendent coming on. And I asked the superintendent, in our first meeting if I could bring the new city manager with me and she said yes and I got to see the two the relationship between the two taxing entities evolve to where it is today so I have family members there educators uh, still have nieces and nephews in school and friends that are teachers so um, I of course would do what I can I think we need to raise teachers pay uh, we need to look at obviously school security I mean, a horrible tragedy in Uvalde. I just can't imagine. I've been there, and I can see how deep that is for the uh, community there. But uh, also education of the students and teachers on how to handle events like that. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll now move to the Q&A portion of our forum. <clears throat> Again, candidates have been notified of these questions ahead of time, and we'll have two minutes to respond. So let's begin. We'll start with the school funding question. The 88th regular legislative session and the additional four special sessions elevated numerous education policy issues at our Texas Capitol. Teacher play, pay, inflationary pressures, the $1.9 billion special education funding shortfall, rethink our, thinking our assessment and accountability systems, and of course, the school choice or voucher debate. Unfortunately, these major policy issues ended up stalling and are on hold until the next regular session in January 2025, unless there's another special session in 2024. Texas entered the 2023 legislative sessions with historic budget surpluses. Over $33 billion was available coming into the regular session. And after funding more than $18 billion for property tax relief, the state still has $18 billion remaining after updated budget estimates. In addition, the legislature set aside $4 billion in the state budget for school funding and $500 million for vouchers that will remain untouched until legislation is passed by both chambers. So our question, given that background, HB1 by Chairman Buckley during the fourth call special session was one of the House's landmark votes on school issues. The bill contained $7.5 billion for school funding, including funds for a $2,000 to $4,000 teacher pay raise. The bill also contained a voucher provision. A vote of 84 to 63 stripped this voucher provision 
and the bill was ultimately withdrawn. What is the path forward for providing public schools and teachers with additional funding? We're gonna move in sort of a random order now between the candidates. So for this question, Mr. Powell, would you start us off? I think the answer is kind of obvious in my opinion. I think if you would uh, separate the vouchers and teacher pay, like those two things don't need to be tied together. And the problem with getting that passed in the last uh, session was the fact that those two things were married. And I think it's important to separate those two issues. I think the two to $4,000 in pay is great. And the teacher right now is making $36,000 a year entry level. I know some of the ISDs are paying a little more than that. Uh, but then top end after 20 plus years, it's like $54,000, less than a $20,000 increase in pay. And the money's there. We obviously have a surplus that we can be using to facilitate that. But I think the most important thing that the legislature needs to do is separate vouchers from teachers pay. Mr. Lopez? I agree. The, uh, the voucher provision needs to be removed from the bill. However, the state of the politics right now within the legislature is if they were serious about doing such a thing, it would have already happened. So, you know, it seems like Greg Abbott is hell-bent on getting his voucher program. You know, funding schools, funding education should be a top priority. It shouldn't be with gimmicks. It shouldn't be with threats. It shouldn't be with special session after special session when he doesn't get his way. So in regards to, you know, Chairman Buckley's bill here, it was apparent that they were trying to dangle the carrot in front of the in front of the horse to try to get what they wanted. And when they play these political games, they need to remember who's being affected up with this. Teachers, custodians, maintenance people, teachers aid. These are real people with real issues, real bills that they have to pay. And for these for this political for the right to be doing this is messing with people's livelihoods. And that's something that we can all, you know, connect with. So if they were serious about this, remove the voucher program, voucher provision on there and fund it, fund education completely. Nothing more to be said. Ms. Castellano. The sad part is, is that Texas ranks 43rd in Texas per student funding. HB1 should be separated, as both, um, both candidates have stated. Our vouchers, we must keep our money in our public schools. We must continue to fund and put mo more money into our schools, fully fund our schools. And as far as the uh, teacher pay, the teacher pay, our teachers deserve more money. Our teachers, our custodians, our janitors. You know, it takes a village to raise our children. And I remember the days when, um, when my children went to public school and it was a custodian that helped out and ensured that my, that my child uh, got fed. And so we need to make sure that we stop playing with the, po we stop playing politics. This was a bipartisan um, majority in the house that defeated this, legislat this legislator voucher scheme. And so we need to stand up to Greg Abbott. We need to say no, we need to say no together, and we need to make sure that we fund our public schools. No to vouchers. And the path for providing for public schools starts now. What you're all doing or educating the public of what are these candidates, us, what we stand for. And also, we need to know what those representatives that are in office, what they stand for. What are they willing to do? I'm a candidate who's been involved in education as a PTA parent. I was a stay-at-home mom, so I had the privilege of going to my children's school uh, every day. I saw how hard these teachers worked on a daily basis. They, were, they weren't only teachers educating subjects. They were also parents who made sure, they acted as parents to our children. They wanted to make sure that they had uh, supplies. They were, they were counselors, they were moms. Um, so they did so much. So they deserve that raise. 
I want to fight for a $15,000 raise for our teachers because they deserve it. They have so many issues that they have to deal with, not only the, the politics of teaching, but they have other issues that they have to deal with. Dealing with, uh, for example, the, their retirement also. They have like the poorest retirement. So how are we gonna keep teachers? How are we gonna hire teachers? They don't have the attrition rate and the retirement rate is, is scary, really. So who's gonna be left to teach our children? So we gotta make sure we do everything for our teachers and it starts by electing individuals who have the character and the experience to do what's right. We need to also work bipartisan and we know the, the result of that. Greg Abbott, well, he held the teacher pay raise and the voucher together and it was hostage to, to our teacher pay raise. If he really cared about teacher pay raise, they would have separated it. Thank you. The following question is about our teacher workforce. Prior to the last session, Governor Abbott asked the Texas Education Agency to establish a teacher vacancy task force. Texas has almost 400,000 teachers across the state. In the most recent Charles Butt Texas Teacher Statewide Poll, 75% of teachers said they were considering leaving the profession, a 20% increase from just three years ago. One of the top priorities for the next legislative session should be how our schools attract, retain, and train our Texas teacher workforce. So the question is, what do you think is the largest obstacle for schools in attracting and retaining our teachers? What can be done at the state level to fix these pressing issues? Mr. Lopez, if you'll begin. Well, to begin with, the state needs to fund education first. Well, obviously, we can't attract teachers with no money, but it can't, be, it can't continue to be the status quo of meagerly funded education funding for these, for these districts. We need to ask the legislature, obviously, to increase funding for it. But right now, the current average salary here in the state of Texas is anywhere from about forty-seven to fifty-five thousand per student, per teacher. Fifteen thousand dollar increase on it would just bring them back to the national average. I don't want average for our teachers. I want the best for them, especially in a state like ours that's so wealthy, right? Give them, give them the seventy-five thousand. Make it a, make it a twenty thousand dollar. It's, it's little to ask for for the responsibility that our teachers do for molding our children. They're mentors. Think about in your life how many teachers affected the path that you, you took in life. These people should be championed. We want the absolute best for them. So obviously the best salary is available, but then again also our school district have to have the best resources, facilities, state-of-the-art equipment. This is difficult in rural areas where funds are limited. But comparing us to maybe a school up in Frisco in North Texas to Uvalde, there's a big difference there. So make teacher pay above the national average, provide good resources for our school ed, school facilities. And I think you'll see retaining, retaining teachers and recruiting teachers would become a lot easier. One of the first things that we should do is obviously increase teacher pay, without a doubt. They're overworked, they're undervalued, and they're underpaid. We also have to look at the retirement. It's one of the worst in the state. As you all know, uh, because of the amendment, they finally had that cost of living adjustment, where they got a measly, depending how many years you were in, 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 uh, in um, Retire, uh, experience, you may have gotten up to maybe $200, $300, which is, which is absolutely ridiculous. We need to make sure we work on the, the retirement, um, and we also need to look at uh, why the reasons why our teachers are, are, are leaving. Obviously, it's because of the poor benefits. Their money goes to the insurance costs. It was one of the insurance causes the worst for our teachers. Everything, they, they can make ends meet 
I know teachers that have other jobs because they cannot make ends meet. And that's, that is really unheard of and I'm dumbfounded about that. But they stay because they care about their children. So they deserve more money. Also, the politics. They, they're conflicted as to what do I teach, how do I teach. You have these issues such as uh, you know, race and sex. You know, so that is also difficult for them. So they have these added pressures. Also, not to mention the star. They are simply just teaching to that test. There should be other considerations of how our schools are rated. And there's other options. And of course, the stress not only for the teachers, but also for our children. So we have to look at all these factors uh, for this. And uh, my time is up. <laughs> Ms. Castilla. As a business owner, um, I know that we strive to ensure that we have the right workplace to attract good employees and to keep them because that's really important. So our teachers have gone through, have taken all this education, have gone their degrees. So number one, let's forgive all teacher loans. And, and number two, let's fund our teachers. Let's fund our teachers to ensure that sometimes some of these teachers are working 12 hour days. They have to be there early in the morning and leave there late at night. They're having to prepare for the next day, prepare their, their agendas, and also, they're also preparing to integrate, to teach per the STARS test. So number three, let's remove this STARS test. There's other ways that we can evaluate our teachers and our students. It's not a one shoe fits all. And number three, I'm sorry, number four, the retirement. Let's ensure that we have the proper retirement plan for our teachers. If small businesses can do this, then I know that our state government can do this. Thank you. And Mr. Powell. And obviously compensating teachers more is one of the ways to get people into the profession, but I kind of group teachers in with uh, firemen and policemen. They just have a passion for it. And luckily that's the case uh, most of the time with the teachers who educate our children, they just have a passion for educating people. And I think, you know, we can look at an increase in pay, but there's other ways. Uh, it's been mentioned that you get up to retirement. There could also be some forgiveness as far as education-wise, whether it's credits towards college or for the children's college, maybe paid pre-K. There's many different things that we can look at, and I, uh, if I elected, those will be some of the things that we will review. I think it needs to be really thought out <laughs> And, you know, just saying, let's just give them a raise. Well, is there other things we can do that it can attract people to the profession? So uh, that would be my charge, is to find out what all is available. Uh, of course, a pay raise. I'd love to see teachers get paid more. They definitely deserve it. I mean, the, the rate of, unfortunately, mental health and, and, you know, we're seeing shootings in schools. And they're putting up with that because they have a passion for education. So we need to compensate them. And I do think that there's many ways that we can look at and uh, see what fits. Of course, we have a surplus that we could use as of right now, but I think we should look at what's sustainable for the future. Thank you. Let's turn now to assessment and accountability. There has been a lot of discussion about the overemphasis on standardized tests in recent years. Our current HRF accountability system is entirely based on STAR to rate our schools at the elementary and middle school levels. In February, the Travis County District Court will decide whether or not to allow TEA to move forward on new college career military readiness rules that will drastically impact the overall ratings of campuses and school districts. So our question, should our accountability system be so dependent on the STAR or on any standardized test? What factors of school quality would you like to see included when rating our public schools? Ms. Cuellar, if you would begin. As you know, the school rating, the A through F rating, is based on three things. Student achievement, 
academic growth performance, and closing the gaps. Again, student achievement has to do with the STAR, has to do with graduation, and has to do with the CCMR, college, career, and military readiness. I believe there has to be a balance in terms of, um, there has to be accountability, and I believe that is why they have the STAR test, but it shouldn't be focused on that. I think it, has, it should be focused on the CCMR. Again, that is to make sure that these children are prepared to go to college. That they go to college, they go to vocational school, or they go to the military. That should be the focus, the achievement, that they graduate. Um, I also believe that um, there is outcome bonuses to districts who fund for preparing these students. That is the incentive where they make sure they, they graduate. I mean, that is the purpose of going to high school is to go to college or go to vocational school. So I believe that this is a good way to balance with accountability, but shouldn't be the focus because we know it stresses the children, it stresses the teacher, and that certainly um, is not good for them. So I believe that we should, Texas, we know that Texas leads the nation when it comes to these uh, efforts that improve college and career readiness. So I think that should be the fair balance. Mr. Powell. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I agree that the, uh, using the STAR test as, as a uh, major indicator of how well the schools are operating it's rough for the teachers. Nobody likes it. The students don't like it. The teachers don't like it. The parents don't like it. I understand the need for some standardized tests to see how progress is going, but we should be looking at also graduation rates, attendance, and I think those uh, focuses, focusing more on that as opposed to the tests would help benefit teachers and students to, uh, you know, just alleviate the burden of it being so important, the, the STAR test being so important. So I think those elements would help and uh, make it a better environment for everybody. Ms. Castellano? School quality. School quality is something that is truly big and very different from the city versus a rural community. Where in, throughout House District 80, many of our schools have been closed down, but yet our teachers are still having to teach to the STARS test. Yes, there should be an accountability measure, but no, we should not be putting all the pressure on our teachers that are not getting paid well and putting all the stress on our children. First and foremost, there's different types of children. The education curriculum right now teaches a one-shoe-fits-all, and it's not a one-shoe-fits-all. Our children learn at a different rate as well in different ways. And so I believe that we need to make sure that we teach our children the way they need to be taught. The teachers have to work together with the special ed department, the 504 department, and ensure that the parents are also involved. So remove all standardized testings. Let's get back to teaching our schools and not all children learn the same. Yes, there needs to be accountability measures on teachers, and there should be also testing on our children every month. But come on guys, not all children can take the same test. Some, pe some children are visual learners and some children are book smart learners. So we need to get back to, we not even get back to, we need to teach our children the way they are and meet them where they are. Our children are learning so fast right now with technology. That's where we need to meet them as well. Thank you. And Mr. Lopez. Well, this argument's been going on for years already about standardized, standardized testing, and I completely agree. They should, they should eliminate the start test and come out with another, another type of either quarterly or, or bi-yearly testing requirement for students based on, based on the curriculum that they're learning at the time. Teachers, educational systems, don't need to be diluted 
by trying to teach to the test, right? There's a lot of issues, and, and there's other communities, like rural communities versus urban, where the social economic conditions don't facilitate students who have families that make less money a fair learning environment. In addition, post-COVID, you've had attendance rates drop almost 10%. It used to be 95% attendance was the norm for school districts. Right now, they're pushing 85 to 90% if they're lucky. So there's been an effect on this, right? Which further reduces the impact. If you use STAR, you have students who aren't going to school, of course the numbers are gonna look worse. You know, so use social economic data to evaluate these schools. In addition, fund these schools. Provide programs where you can measurably identify the success of teachers. Sort of like college classes, right? You don't teach for the whole universe unless you're in a master's degree, but teach the curriculum, test at intervals, and at the end have a final. Do that similar in, 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 in the elementary schools, and I think you'd see a lot of success with it. Thank you. The last topic for tonight is pre-kindergarten education. During the 85th legislative session in 2019, Texas made great strides to increase funding for pre-kindergarten instruction, expanding the amount of money and qualifying enrolled for full-day pre-kindergarten. And yet, Texas still does not have a universal pre-K system in place to provide free pre-kindergarten for all students who apply for public school education. So our final question for this evening is, would you support increasing funding and opening up admittance for all students to participate in full day pre-kindergarten? If yes or no, why? And we'll start with Ms. Castellana. Yes, I support full pre-K attendance. Why? One out of 10 children are diagnosed with dyslexia or some type of learning disability. So I believe that early detection is very imperative. Second, I believe that our children need to attend pre-K because that's like the crucial time that our children, our babies are learning, wanna learn, are eager to learn. And I believe that if we start early, we can ensure that our children graduate, that our children attend college, or go to a vocational school, or join the military. But I do believe that um, we should fully fund our pre-K. Thank you. Mr. Lopez? I have a funny story about this, but yeah, yes, I, I totally, uh, I think the state should allow you know full full attendance for pre-K. My daughter, we lived in the Mansfield area, Dallas Fort Worth area, and I remember we had tried enrolling her in pre-K, and we didn't qualify. And the very next year, we moved to Valley. I'm born and raised in Valley, but we when I got out of the military, we lived in the Dallas uh, uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. But the very following year, when we moved back to Valley, when she enrolled in kindergarten. I remember we got a call from the teacher and she goes, did your daughter go to pre-K by any chance? And I, and I said, no. And she goes, well, we asked her and she said, yeah, she said she went to the kid's place, which was the daycare, which the teacher thought it was kind of funny, right? But what I'm trying to get at was she was behind an entire year compared to her fellow students. And it required a lot of hard work from our part too, as a parent should, catching her up. So. A child shouldn't be denied entry to pre-K or any other early learning environment based on financial situations, you know what I mean? Whatever the criteria is, education is a right for our children. The earlier we mold them, the earlier we can instill learning into them is much better. It's an investment for the state. It's an investment for them. So think of education as an investment for our people, for just like the GI Bill was for veterans after post-World War II. When you invest in your community and your children, the payoff is gonna be immense. Mr. Powell. 100% yes, I would. I think we should fund pre-K. I actually went to four and five-year-old kindergarten when I was a kid, I was fortunate to get to do that. And 
most of the answers that I have here tonight, and this one in particular, is uh, I have my sister-in-law as an educator, and we talked about this, and the advancements that you can have when you get kids in the school with not only just the learning starting you know, years before, but the structure and environment and being able to work with others. So 100%, I would uh, be in favor of that. Absolutely. My senator, the Dean Zafferini, introduced legislation to have pre-K for all. I think it is a wonderful idea. I'm a product of early education. I was a Head Start student, and I was a member of the Head Start Policy Council for many years as well. So I saw the value of an early education and the foundation and it made a huge difference to the lives of these children. And then being involved in the parent teacher and talking to, the, to all the teachers in the elementary level, they would all comment how these children that went to Head Start were way in advance of all other children. So yes, we need to make sure that all children have that crucial foundation so they can succeed. That concludes the Q&A portion of our forum, and we'll now move to closing remarks. Again, each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks. Mr. Uh, Powell. Well, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming. I appreciate it. My fellow candidates, uh, thank you all for coming. I uh, hope to continue service. I've had a service heart to the military, uh, still an uh, officer in the Texas State Guard. Uh, serving my community as a council member and mayor, it seems like a natural progression to move on to this, and it's an open seat. So I uh, really would like to represent y'all as the state rep for District 80. Mr. Lipton. Well, one of the things I recently, about a year ago, I decided to become an educator. I was afforded an opportunity to, to uh, develop a construction program at Southwest Texas Junior College. You know, I'm a business owner and, and the president of the, co of the college said, hey, we're, we're opening this program and I understand your, your degrees are in construction. I was like, yeah. So initially it was slated to be, you know, one or two hour thing, but as the program progressed and as we taught and as we, I saw the expression on the students, I keep trying, sometimes I call them kids, but they're students, right? They're students, they're young adults. <coughs> and I see the impact of what knowledge passing on the torch of skills does to people. It sold me. I'm, a, I'm an educator and I'm a proud educator now. I love it because it feels like we're pushing the ball forward. We're enlightening students. We're changing their lives. We're molding them. We're mentoring them. These are the, these are the things that educators do. And we, must, we, we should champion these people, whether it's at the, at the elementary level, at the high school level, like I told you previously, educators mold our leaders and we should fight for them and i just hope greg abbott and his group of people learn the priorities of what education plays especially in the rural counties eliminate eliminate the vouchers fund public schools fully with an increase and you'll see the dividends pay off i'm carlos lopez i'm running for district 80 i'm the district 80. Ms. claire bueno, primeramente le quiero dar las gracias aquí a esta organización para la oportunidad para hablar por ustedes y también para la audiencia que habla en español. Mi nombre es Rosy Cuellar, soy una abogada, fui juez de la corte anteriormente, también fui, fui asesora recaudadora de impuestos para el condado de Web. Yo vengo de raíces humildes, pero nuestros padres nos enseñaron siempre, siempre obtener una educación buena, siempre trabajar con diligencia, pero siempre ayudar a los demás. Yo estuve involucrada en mi comunidad por 40 años, en donde me enfoqué en el futuro de nuestros niños. Mi corazón está en ayudar nuestra comunidad y yo tengo ese comprobante y todo guiado nuestros niños. 
Yo quiero esa, esta oportunidad para ayudar a nuestras familias. Yo tengo la experiencia, tengo el carácter que es necesario para luchar por nuestras familias. I have the experience and the character as a judge and as a tax assessor and being in public service, your character is certainly tested. And if people that know me in Laredo, Webb County, they know I'm firm, but very compassionate. So I ask you all to please have your, uh, vote for me. I feel I have the diverse and personal experience which is needed in this very, very important race. Thank you and God bless. Well, family and friends of House District 80, <clears throat> I firmly believe that investing in our public education is investing in our future. And I also believe that as a small minority woman on firm that has had her company for 18 years in a male dominating industry, that I know how to work with all people. It is very important that we could work with both sides and not put each other down, but work together because that's what's gonna make a difference. People are tired of the politics. People are tired of the, of the fighting. It's time that when we're in Austin, that we write bills that are gonna be sensible, common sense bills that are gonna be for the people and that are gonna work for the people. So I humbly ask that you do your homework and that you read up at ceciliafortexas.com and that you consider voting for Cecilia Castellano for your next state representative for House District 80, because together we are stronger. Thank you. This concludes our candidate forum. Let's show our gratitude to the candidates for participating. Well, I'd like to thank everyone again. Thank you to the candidates for being here tonight. Thank you to all of you for making the time to, to come tonight and hear from the candidates. I would also like to thank the City of Curious Springs for the issues of space. It's a great space. And everyone who helped plan, uh, Albert, Tony, Terry, Jeff, uh, over the past few weeks, uh, until my questions helped me plan and helped me uh, invite everyone. So, to be here tonight. I do want to uh, invite everyone to join us in standing up, in standing up for public education. If you text, uh, raise my hand. Uh, what is it? 40649. 40. I'll also see it right here if you forget later 4 on. 40649. <laughs> I will put it on the slide in a minute. Uh, and remind everyone to, to go vote. Tomorrow is the start of early vote. Uh, February 23rd is the last day because it was uh, uh, followed by now. Uh, the 20th uh, it starts uh, early voting. Election day is on the 20th. Uh, check with your county to see where you, where you can go vote. Um, and don't forget to vote. We hope that you become a public education voter. Um, and I think that's it for tonight. Thank you again to all our candidates. Uh, there's some refreshments left uh, on the table. Please feel free to take some more. More and uh, the candidates will be here. We know there's a lot of questions in the hearts of minds of everyone tonight. And uh, if you have any other questions you might like to ask the candidates, um, 